Isn't it beautiful out there though this morning? Uh, when Jean let the dog out this morning, she had to go out and just enjoy the cool air to start with. It just felt so good. And uh, like I said, it's good to see you all here this morning. We're a smaller group. Again, today it's kind of up and down this time of the year with vacations and trips and so forth. So we wish everyone that is not here well, and especially wish you well as well. So, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. You filled the gap very well there. It's good to see your announcements this morning. I would like you to notice in there that uh, Gene and I will be on vacation next week. And uh, Pastor Brian Emmett is going to be standing in if anyone needs some pastoral care while we're gone. So we'll be gone from the 8th through the 13th. And he's going to fill the gap for me during that time. And uh, Chester will be preaching next week. So be here and, and enjoy what he has to uh, share with you during that time. Uh, on the 18th, after, the week after that, we have the back to school bash. And don't forget that. Everybody's welcome. We're going to do that church in the park thing. Yes? There is a sign up back there on the sheet back there. And, oh, come on now, folks. we got to jump in and help her on this. They're, 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 they want 16 dozen cookies. Two to a package. Yes, eight dozen packages of two each, but that's 16 dozen. Don't make her jump in there and do that all by herself. Jump in and help. We need to help to, remember, this is how we reach out to the, the children and the, and the young families in our, in our community. And it's, it's getting bigger every year, which means it's working. All right, we're reaching and they're knowing we're here. And that's, that's what our goal is with this. And then through that we can introduce them to Jesus. I also want you to notice there about the middle of the right hand side of your bullet that we're planning on a membership church information class for in September. And uh, if you're interested in joining the church, please let me know. And then, or if you just want to come and learn at the class, learn a little bit about what our tenets of faith are and what we our, how our bylaws are supposed to work. <laughs> and I'm going to have to, okay, we're not going to, I'm not going to teach you all 31 pages of that, all right? But I picked out the highlights. And if anybody has questions beyond that, we can pick that as well. I also want you to realize that we have a full set of the bylaws printed off that if you want to look them over, study them a little bit, see what's going on, we just ask that you would check it out. They just not disappear out of there because it is 31 pages long. The one that we have printed out is not the signed copy. It is an updated, but I have got uh, the whole board together to actually approve that this is that I put in there what we said we were going to put in there. All right, and that at that point it would be signed off. But the one that's there is complete. So if you're curious about what we have to believe and what we, how we're supposed to govern our, our body, check it out. It's, it's there. I, I even put a nice big ECC poster on the front so it looked real official. <laughs> Not that that helps anything, but I felt proud of myself that I found it anyway. Um, notice there are some birthdays. The Chapmans are both having a birthday coming up this week. And uh, Angela Geske, she's going to be coming up next Sunday. So keep her in mind. And there's a man. No. <clears throat> oh, yeah, that is, but that was, <clears throat> that was the end of their day. Okay, Mike. Happy birthday the other day. <laughs> We have a couple of anniversaries coming up too. Yes, just our next week and then at the end of the month. These are these are these are the good things that we share. Now there's some things that are not so happy and joyful. We know we're notified just the other day that Shirley Chapman's sister has passed away. So do be with her and family as they they you know, it's a struggle. I, 
even when you know where they're going, it's a struggle to lose someone. And so we would be in prayer with them over that. I have uh, no other announcements that I know of, or is there, there anything else that you all would like? Yes, Mary. Pastor, are you there to send the cards in the back? One for Yolanda with the loss of Jesse and one for Shirley with the okay. loss of Okay. Two uh, sympathy cards to be signed in the back. One for Yolanda and one for Shirley both. So we're both struggling with that, these losses. And that's all I have. So if you'll bow your heads for an opening prayer. Lord, we come this day, having seen the miracles of everyday creation, in our world. We have enjoyed both the bright sunshine and the life-giving rains. And the marvel over the beauty of flowers and the complexity of your creation. Make our hearts ready to truly receive your word for us today. And may the worship we offer to you be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Amen. The first hymn of this morning is Seek ye first the kingdom of God, number 405 in the red hymnals. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. Psalm 57 9. So stand if you are able and join and sing.
word to read those signals, you know? Isn't that right, guys? Got to know those signals. It is time now when we lift up our, our joys and our concerns before the Lord. Those things that, well, right now that are family, because we are a family. This is the family of God. And therefore, is there, are there any things that you would like to share before the family? Beyond the group continuing to pray for Yolanda and her family, and for Shirley and her family, and their lost of loved ones. Kathy's sister who has surgery on Tuesday, is that right? Tuesday. And Oh, joy for the program that Larry did on us for the men, men's breakfast yesterday. I gotta tell you, he did a really good job and it was enjoyable. But you can tell he don't like being in front of everybody talking <laughs> like that too much. <laughs> but he did it, and that's important that we do it even if we're a little uncomfortable at the time. Any others? Then would you bow your heads to prayer? Abba, Father, you are the one true God, and we honor you as creator of all things. We look around and we see the beauty of your world, the blossoming flowers and plants, the growth of children, the joy of celebrations like graduations and marriages, of receiving new life, and we know that it is all by your grace and power that it is so. Open our hearts that we might truly pray for you, your will to be done, not just in the world out there, but in our very hearts as well. And therefore we lift up today those who are hurting physically and emotionally right now. Those who are confused and at a loss. Those who are needed for homes and basic subsistence. And especially those who are lost souls looking and not seeing that they're looking for you. And all of these we give over to you, trusting in your daily care for each one of them and for ourselves as well. Lord, where we have wronged, strengthen us to ask for forgiveness. And where we have been hurt, help us to forgive, that we might be truly disciples who mirror what you have taught. Lord, protect us from the trials and temptations that are, are bound around us. And now that we thank you that you have heard these our prayers, offered in the precious name of Jesus, who was and is and ever will be the only Savior of the world. Amen. Yes. Our great grandson that was born August 1st, Parson John Brown. Isn't that a cool name? He has a big brother named Ransom Israel Brown. So we are happy to have another great grandson. That gives us three now. <laughs> yes, and that is definitely a joy. And I should have remembered that. I would have thought. Mm. So, at the Old Testament scripture at this point is taken, it's Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with all my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For they, for you are have exalted, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. 
but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. The praise given this morning is Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. It's in the faith we sing, number 2171. And the ladies have worked hard on this, so get ready to join in and don't make them go to the solo, all right? You may be great seated.
just a little bit. If you look over here, just because I want to be able to say I, I, I don't know, I'll let you know I'm ready, the first thing that I was going to talk about was the fact that the Lord's Prayer is actually a gift. It's a gift, God's gift to us. And it gives gifts in it. And what's going to start out with is what was a gift that you remember? And you can do this too. Think about it. What gift did you get from a family member that you really remember? And why did you get it? Think about that. Why did you get that gift? I got this. Doesn't that look like a fun one? Gene got to watching me come to church. The barns full of two or three trips as I carried out my computer and my books and, and my papers and my folder and all this stuff. So she got this to me for Christmas. It's a whole office in there, folks. I've got calculators, I've got eight pen, my computer, everything's in here. And it's pretty amazing. But she gave it to me. She gave it to me because she loves me. And Jesus gave us the gifts of the, of, that we find within the Lord's Prayer as gifts to us because He loves us. And so I just wanted, I didn't want to not be able to say that because I worked hard to try to remember to say it. Okay? So here we go. <laughs> and now Jean has a, a special she's going to do for you. And uh, Matt's going to push the button back there and we're going to take off. says, 
Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said that to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for our, we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which one of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his emptiness, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if he has sons who ask for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? And if he asks for me, will you give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask you? Dear Lord, as I give this message this morning, I ask that you would again put me aside. Let each person who hears this message take from it what you want him to hear and to take. And to act on that message. For it is in your son's name I pray it. Amen. I'm going to start this sermon with a confession that was made by a Christian recording artist, Taran, Taran Wells, that actually when he did, when I read it, it just kind of reached out and touched me. He said, I've been praying all wrong. Shocking, I know. A church staff, pastor, worship leader, Christian artist, praying wrong. Absolutely. I know there's supposedly no wrong way to pray, right? Well, I'm not so sure. To be clear, I'm not talking about our choice of words, whether or not we're filling the sentences with old tiny English as, as required to talk to God, or if it matters if you cut or cut, cut up or cut out and whisper your prayers or shout out. I think those types of things are up to you and that God hears them all. However, what I realized about my prayers is that they were usually starting in the wrong place. Now he went on to say that with coffee in hand, sitting in about the fourth row, which is why I was counting rows earlier, uh, I mentioned that because you get extra points for sitting in the first five rows. So I was counting. You lose out. Uh, <laughs> yep, you made the five fifth row. Yep. Uh, people are, you know, it, or it's just funny. But think about it. How often do you sit up front where you really can hear easy? It's, it's, a, it's a good thing. But anyway, but he was sitting there in a small, thriving church, and the pastor, he said, dropped a quote that seemed to weigh a thousand pounds squarely on his ten toes. In a message about prayer, that pastor said, if God were to answer all the prayers you've been praying, would it change anyone else's life but your own? It was then and there I realized that my prayers were not prioritized correctly. You see, my life and the things that concerned only me were at the top of a very short list. And he went ahead and say, it made me wonder, how much of God's miraculous power are we unable to experience? Because we never pray prayers that are bigger than us. Now, Lord spoke about getting his toes stepped on, and I have to admit that his confession rather had the same effect on me as that preacher who mentioned had on him. How about you? When he says, if he answered all those prayers, all the prayers you've been praying, would it change anyone else's life but your own? 
Does that make your toes ache just a bit? So let's look at the prayer Jesus taught his disciples in today's text and talk a bit about what that prayer has to say about prayer and where prayer should start and what should be there in our prayer. To start with, there is something though about this prayer that I never noticed until I was actually pre pre preparing for this sermon. And that is as I went through it, there is nowhere in that prayer where there is a personal singular pronoun statement. There is not a single I, me, or my in that prayer. The entire prayer was for the community, for the family of God, for the koinonia. It was the fellowship. It was everybody's prayer. It was designed and was first shown and told as a prayer to be prayed together as a group. Now, the pattern of the prayer can still be used individually, but that's interesting. I've never noticed or thought about the fact that it's all we, us, not me and I. When the disciples first Saw Jesus, saw Jesus performing miracles and teaching. They didn't holler and say, Lord, teach us how to teach like you do. Or, God, please help us. We learn how to do a miracle. They didn't do, they didn't do any of that. Instead, what captured their attention was hearing him pray. There was something about watching Jesus pray that made them want to learn to pray as Jesus prayed. There's something magnetic about the prayer life that Jesus had. And the way he prayed shows something, frankly, about his relationship with God the Father. So notice, now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. They wanted to know how to talk to God in prayer. And notice what Jesus gave them when he asked, they asked the question. In the first four verses, we discover a plan that will help us pray in a way that is pleasing to God. And it helps us keep on track. First off, you start off with praise. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. Praise is an important part of our prayer life. We must always remember to honor Heavenly Father. We are the creations of the Creator. And it's a natural, it should be a natural thing for us to worship and honor the Heavenly Father. Jesus teaches his disciples to approach God as they approach their fathers. Now that's real interesting to me because the people that Luke was actually writing his gospel to, and he was telling this, were actually Gentiles, the Greco Roman. Roman culture, and you know, I want you to know the Greco-Roman culture had fatherhood issues. They were grossly patriarchal type, to the point where a father decided whether that newborn baby was raised in the family, kicked out, or even killed. And no one could complain one way or the other, whichever choice he made. They had a potential for some very major fatherhood issues. But nevertheless, he taught them. Luke went ahead and gave them the prayer that Jesus said, Our Father. He introduced them, basically, to Yahweh. Abba, Father. A loving God who cares for his children and acts redemptively on their behalf. He changed their perspective of fatherhood by going ahead and teaching them that. So that our Father is talking about a personal relationship. Our Father. Abba. The second is the purpose of prayer. Your kingdom come. Now it's easy to forget that we have a responsibility to fulfill God's purpose in this world. We are a people on a mission, and we should be mindful 
and sensitive to the work of His kingdom in our daily lives. Each day, we are to be busy about kingdom business, sharing the word, sharing that God is good, trying to introduce them through our lives and our the way that we behave, to introduce them to Jesus. And this is not just talking about the generic word, though, world out there, when we're talking about it in the, in the prayer. This is, it's uh, not something that's separate from us out there, okay? This is talking about us. We, we allow God to be king in our lives, our personal lives. We make it for his kingdom to come within our lives. And in effect, what we're asking for in this prayer is that he will rule as king in us and in the world. That's how that works. He is Lord and we are his servants. The third thing is that we pray for is physical needs. Give us each day our daily bread. One of the promises that we should give us hope for each day is that God does indeed supply our needs. When we pray, it is part of the instructions from Jesus that we ask the Father for the things that we need to make it through each day. The symbolism of this being that particularly impactful for the people of that time. Day laborers at that time were always paid at the end of the day. Matter of fact, the law says to pay them at the end of the day and don't hold anything for the next day. The idea being is they actually were living day to day, one day at a time. They needed their daily bread. They needed their daily wages so they had food and bread. And with that, that piece of message would mean especially something to them. It should mean something to us as well, but especially to them. If they were sick or missed a couple of days' pay, they didn't eat. So to pray God to give us our daily bread. But since it's part of the plan, we should never hesitate to ask for our needs. They are, they are important. But you also notice it's our daily bread. He's not asked, telling us to ask for a warehouse full of it. Daily bread. Daily provision for all the essentials of life. That's what we're talking about. Daily. Thank Him for the food we eat, the home we live in, even the car we get to work in. Daily. Thank Him for those things. God is the source of life and everything that sustains life. And so that's what's covered by that part of the phrase. The fourth thing is for our spiritual needs. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. There's not a day goes by that we should not be mindful of the forgiveness, grace, and compassion of God. It's a healthy reminder to think of ourselves as participants in a weekly meeting of Sinners Anonymous. We're all here. We all know we're sinners. We're just not telling everybody all about it, okay? It's Sinners Anonymous. The sins we confess are forgiven, and we are set free. But God provides for our spiritual needs, and we should not neglect to continue asking for that help. So forgive us our sins. A faithful child reflects the image and values of the Father. So Jesus expects us to reflect the forgiving nature of God. And we do that by forgiving each other as we have been forgiven. How can the world learn of God's forgiveness unless we manifest that forgiveness in our own lives so the world can see it? The fifth thing we're to pray for is protection and lead us not to temptation. Now the Greek word that's translated as temptation here literally means a test. It's not necessarily a solicitation to go do something evil. And it makes sense, doesn't it? That the same loving, compassionate, and kind Savior that would go to such lengths to have a relationship with us that he would come here and go through what he went through would all, that he would also take time to protect 
us? Wouldn't that just make sense? God does not tempt us. If you remember, James 1.13 says He will allow us to be tested. And though we are tested, 1 Corinthians 10, chapter 10, verse 13 and 14 says, God has promised to keep us from any testing that's greater than what we can handle. And He provides a way of escape. He allows us to be tested. Not that He tests us, but He also doesn't give us more than we can take, and He'll give us a way out. And His plans, you see, and His desire for us are so much bigger than anything that we might plan for ourselves. And He knows that we have a problem understanding everything. So He gave us a couple of parables to help us understand more about the prayer. And the parables take up most of the Scripture today, in case you didn't notice that. The teaching on prayer was actually three verses. The rest of it was <coughs> gave us something for us to understand what he was getting at. The first part, up through verses five through nine, says, because he is his friend and yet his impudence or persistence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Jesus takes time to explain the importance of persistence using a parable. Like the man in the parable, we need to be faithful to keep asking. You must always remember that the Father does want to hear from you. He is always willing to listen. You don't annoy Him when you come with Him. Come to Him with a heart that desires what He wants best for you. Our persistence, and I thought this was interesting, our persistence doesn't change God. It changes us. Isn't that an interesting thought? We don't change God. He doesn't just suddenly decide He's going to do it. It changes our hearts as we're praying. It changes us, developing us a heart and a passion for what God wants. And we're told to keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. All three of these verbs are continuous. Jesus is not speaking about single activities, but those that persist and continue that's why we know that he meant persistence in the early part of this of the lesson. Now there's another, another option for translating the word that was translated as persistence, and that is the one that was used in the English Standard Version, which is impudence or shamelessness is another word for it. Instead of using the word persistence. And that would be a lack of sensitivity over what is Proper. A willful lack of concern about public shame over what you're doing, okay? And a theologian named Walter Leifold suggests that if you use the shamelessness meaning of the word, you get a different dynamic and a different sort of lesson from that teaching. It says, though the petitioner acts in a shameful way by disturbing his neighbor and his, their neighbors, in the night, late at night, his neighbor deals with the shame in a way that will bring honor to them both. And with that in mind, perhaps a better way to think about hallowed be your name would be that God will act to honor God's name even when we act in dishonorable ways. But that's an interesting way to look at that. It's a good way, an additional way, not instead of an additional way to look at that. God will act to honor God's name even when we act in dishonorable ways. Either way, God wants us to, as my son-in-law Rob says, keep on keeping on in Jesus. Or in this case, keep on praying in Jesus. Now there's a promise to the prayer that he gives in verses 10 through 13. He can, so concludes his lesson on prayer by sharing with his disciples the principle of asking and receiving. If you keep looking, you will find an answer. If you keep knocking, the door will be open. Jesus shares some of the most refreshing and reassuring news that we could ever have. How much more will the Heavenly Father give of the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? We are promised 
that God hears in response to our prayers. And that's good news for his children. The closing promises is for the receipt, though, of the Holy Spirit rather than material things, which often surprises those of us in our culture. But that's the petition that your kingdom come will give you. People who receive the Holy Spirit and are sent out as agents for the coming kingdom. It reflects God's desire to pour out His Spirit. The problem is not in God's desire to give it, but it's in our desire to receive it. Always remember, He answers prayer. Yes, no, maybe, in the future, He answers prayer. We may or may not be ready for the answer. So don't let any, don't allow yourself to become weary as you pray. The reminder from Jesus on how to pray should encourage us. When it seems like the prayers are slow, remember this passage. Jesus knew we would feel that way, and he tells us to keep on praying. It is also okay to pray shamelessly in the reckless manner. We find security in the fact that God hears and will respond to our prayers. If you are willing to describe your prayer life, if you were going to do so right now, would you use words like persistent, or persevering, or impudent, or shameless? This teaching by Jesus should inspire us to have a stick-to-it attitude about prayer. And maybe even prayer with a little bit of reckless abandonment. Give it all to him. He's ready to hear it all. Please hear this prayer. Father, help us take to heart the lessons we can receive from the prayer you taught your first disciples all those years ago. May your kingdom come into our hearts this morning as we keep praying to you with reckless abandon. Amen. And if you give me a moment, I'll get ready for communion. Grace and peace to you from God who is and who was and who is to come. Unite us in faith and hope through the Holy Spirit so that we may continue to be guided by your word and will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, now and forevermore. Amen. And you've heard me say before, and I'll say it again. If you read in Matthew, you'll find that it says that after they ate their communion supper, they sang a hymn and then went out. So if you'll stand and join us in the closing hymn.
used in your life. Be assured that there are still more miracles to come and bear witness to God's love to all you meet. In the name of the Creator, our God, the Holy One, who resides in you always, go in peace.